Hey you guys, here we are back again with yet another book review. I think this is one that I talked about way back on my TBR show. It was kind of in my pile of books that I had read a long time ago, uh, but I remembered really liking and wanted to revisit them for this show. Because I had like a whole bunch of uh, paperbacks that I bought back in the day when I was reading and buying like a really lot of horror fiction. And uh, I'm really glad I got to revisit the, this one. I kind of, I remembered the premise and that was about it. Uh, but I actually really ended up uh, liking it and enjoying it very much also the second time. This is Dark Fall by Stephen Laws. Now, uh, interestingly, there's also a novel uh, by Dean Koontz, which is also called Dark Fall. I'm not sure if it came out around the same time as this, but like, I haven't read that one, so I don't know if it's any good or not, but they, the two of them have nothing to do with each other. I'm not, I have to say, I've only read like a couple of Dean Koontz novels. I'm not a massive fan, but you know what I mean? It's like, I, I haven't really read enough of his stuff to, you know, have too much of an opinion about it. I'm just saying I've read a couple of his and I didn't really like him all that much. However, Stephen Laws is uh, actually quite rad. He's a British writer. He's from Newcastle upon Tyne, I believe. And that is where this book is set. I've actually, when I was thinking about it, I was looking at his, um, you know, all of his novel output and stuff. And I'm like, actually, I think I've read several of his. I read uh, one called The Worm, which is W-Y-R-M, which is kind of like almost like a folk horror type thing, which was very good. Um, and I read one and I might have it in my closet or in the attic or something like that called Fear Me, which I think was like a stalker vampire -y type of story. Uh, and that was also very good. Stephen Laws kind of writes, he occupies like the same kind of space generally as somebody like Richard Lehman or Bentley Little or something like that. Kind of extreme horror, not as extreme maybe as, you know, like Jack Ketchum or something like that. But there is, this book in particular has a lot of kind of weird, like it's almost, I almost want to say sci-fi, but not quite. Uh, but it does have a lot of like body horror. At the end of it almost kind of goes like in a Clive Barkery sort of direction. So if you don't want to know anything about this book, other than they do give a couple things away on the back, but uh, if you don't want to know anything about it before going in, this is actually a really good book. It's very fast paced. Uh, it's a page turner. You're just going to, and it's kind of like, it's good because it's sort of, mostly centered around one location and it's just kind of like almost kind of like a survival horror to like people just trying to like get out of this place or like get away from a bunch of monsters and stuff so if that sounds like something that is up your alley like i said there's some pretty gross uh, body horror and you know transmogrification type shit going on later on uh if that sounds like something you'd like then go read it i'm not necessarily gonna spoil the end or anything but again it's like really hard to talk about books, movies, anything without saying what happens in the plot. Uh, so, you know, so if you don't want to know anything about it, then go read it and then come back. I kind of feel like, okay, so the copyright on this says 1992, but this particular edition, which I believe is from Leisure Books, who, like I said, were doing a lot of paperback horror in the early 2000s, this actually came out in 2003, this version of it here. It seems like it's kind of, I don't know, it seems like it's kind of difficult to get some of his stuff because some of it's gone out of print. I'm not sure if he's still writing. He's he's written like a bunch of novels and a bunch of short stories. And I believe he also teaches or used to teach uh, creative writing, that type of stuff. So. I'm not really sure if he's uh, still around, but like I said, it's just like a really good, it's like an action packed thrill ride type of book. You know what I mean? It's just kind of like all, almost all in one location and it's just people like trying to get away from it and like, you know, bad shit keeps happening to them and they're trying to like get out of the situation. So we'll get into that. What the premise of this, and I actually kind of love the premise of this. The reason why I say it's kind of like sci-fi it, but it's one of those kind of sci-fi uh, concepts that's just kind of like, don't think about it too hard. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? It's that type of thing. But, uh, you know, it's because it almost kind of ha kind of has like a little bit of like an alchemical type of, uh, you know, sort of veneer to it, which actually I quite like. So this story starts out with a guy who's like um, the caretaker, you know, janitor type, uh, you know, custodian type dude. And he is in the basement of this big, huge uh, office building. I think it's called Fernley House uh, Office Park or whatever in Newcastle upon Tyne. It's Christmas Eve and he's down in the basement, uh, you know, drinking as you do. 
on Christmas Eve. And uh, upstairs, uh, there are a bunch of like office parties going on, like all these different companies that are in this office block have, you know, closed the doors for the day. But, you know, now it's presumably like 6 or 7 p.m. And, you know, back in the back in the day, back in the 90s, I don't know how common this is nowadays, but they kind of just like decorate the office, bring in some alcohol, put, you know, somebody put some flashy lights and disco music on or whatever. And everybody starts dancing, getting drunk, making out with coworkers that they will regret the next day, all that type of stuff. So all of that is presumably going on upstairs. Uh, the custodian downstairs is really kind of cranky about it because like I said, he had to work and he just thinks they're a bunch of twee gits or whatever they would say, like in the UK, like up there partying and whatnot. But then something interesting happens like or something actually quite horrifying happens he hears these really really loud banging sounds and they seem to be coming from the boilers now he's never heard anything quite this horrific before so he jumps to the reasonable conclusion that the boilers are you know over overheating or whatever or that they're going to explode so he's basically like well shit, I have to go upstairs and get all these people out of here. Now, meanwhile, there's also like a really bad storm going on outside. Uh, and one that seems a little like way, way worse than usual. It's just there's snow and lightning and thunder and everything like that, way worse than usual. And also there's like something seemingly very mysterious about it. So he tries to go upstairs to warn all of these people, um, you know, hey, the boiler might explode. We really need to get everybody out of the building. He attempts to contact various authorities and can't really get hold of anybody, mostly because it's Christmas Eve. Everyone's just kind of, you know, dicking around or they want to go home or whatever. And also because uh, the storm outside has caused a lot of kind of electrical disturbances. So he can't really seem to raise anyone like on the phone or the radio or anything like that. So he goes upstairs to try to get people out of the building. And it is then that he notices, even though it looks like everybody was still like partying, uh, as in music and lights are still going, um, you know, people's drinks and food is just like still sitting there. Everyone in the building has mysteriously disappeared and he can't figure out where the fuck they went. Now, at first he's kind of like, well, maybe they all just left and like they just left in this big mess like this. But he's like, that can't be. It's like, why? You know, he's like, I didn't hear anybody leave. I didn't see anybody leave. It's like there was like, I think there was something like 60 people in there, like having parties in various offices. And he's like, you know, people don't just disappear. Now he thinks it's weird, but he doesn't really think anything too badly about it at this point. However, when he goes into one office and he kind of goes behind this like screen or whatever, he finds what is very obviously a severed human hand, which has been severed very cleanly at the wrist. At which point he flips the fuck out, as he would, and calls the police. Now, because he warned the police, he's like, look, I came up here because I thought the boiler was gonna explode. Um, obviously, but he's like, look, I found this hand up in here. Everybody's gone. I don't know where they went. All their cars are still in the, in the parking lot. He's like, so it's just super weird. All these people just went, like, went missing. So the cops get there and uh, as soon as they send a team in there to determine that the boilers are in fact fine and they're not going to explode so they can't figure out what that noise was that started off this whole adventure, they don't really believe him. Uh, not only because this is a crazy story, hey, 60 people just vanished into thin air and oh, also there's like a severed man's hand laying on the floor for no reason, um, but also because he had been drinking prior. So, and he's not, you know, he's kind of drunk and he's kind of like freaked out, uh, not only because of the noise, but because of everybody like being gone. So he's not being like super articulate. So they basically think, okay, well, this guy's just a nutcase or it's a prank or something like that. So they don't uh, really do all that much about it. However, as the night goes on, other people start getting involved and it seems that maybe the storm that's going on outside is kind of a particular, I want to call it like a scientific or an atmospheric or something like that anomaly. And it turns out too that there's this, uh, one of those secret government agencies that kind of knows what this is because it's like happened before. So basically what's going on, and like I said, from this point, cause all that stuff like about him, you know, about the guy finding the hand and everybody being missing, all that stuff is kind of like gone into on the back of the book. But from this point forward, um, this is kind of like spoilery, like just, it, it, you know, it, just about like plot points in general. So as I said, this is kind of like last chance 
if you want to read it and not know anything about Gomes, because I think this book is really good if you don't know where it's going. You know what I'm saying? Because it's kind of one of those things where it's almost like the first half of it, it's fairly long. It's like 400 something pages, but the first half of it is kind of like a mystery because you're not really sure, like where the fuck did all these people go? Um, you know, where? Uh, how did this hand get here? You know, and then like even crazier shit starts happening later as in, this one woman turns up like on the streets of London, you know, several, you know, many miles away from Newcastle. She turns up in the street. She doesn't really remember where she is. She's all disheveled. And she basically starts attacking people and she kind of goes out into the road and a car swerves to avoid her and smashes into like a pole or something like that. And then she jumps into the car and starts eating the dude's face. So, you know, there's, there's kind of that kind of shit going on. Also elsewhere, there's this other couple and they're kind of like cooking a turkey in their kitchen or whatever. And they hear this horrendous crash, like in their backyard. And they go out there and see that their greenhouse, their glass greenhouse has been broken. And at first they just think, oh, it's some, you know, neighborhood kids or whatever being dicks and throwing rocks at it. But then they find out that no, a body has crashed through the top of this greenhouse and they can't figure out where the body came from and the body doesn't have a hand and it wasn't severed. So you're led to believe that this is the owner of the hand that they found back at the office block, um, which they quickly determine through triangulating, you know, various IDs and stuff like that. But this guy, they're like, well, nobody threw the body into the greenhouse and there's nothing above your house. So obviously it fell from a great height. He, maybe he fell out of an airplane. That's pretty much all that they uh, know about it. So as the story goes on and kind of our main protagonist, uh, cause like I said, at first you're, it's kind of like the dude that's the custodian. Cause he's like the first experiencer of it. And then like some other cops come in, but then they get this one detective in there named Jack Cardiff, who was kind of like your main protagonist. Um, he's still on the force, but at the beginning of the book, he's actually really suicidal. I believe it was like a year prior. Uh, he had been involved in a hit and run, like a, um, like a driver had crashed up onto the pavement or the sidewalk, uh, as we'd say in the U S and hit him and also hit his wife and his son, uh, his wife and his son were killed, uh, but he survived and he's haunted by this vision of the person who is driving the car, who he is certain had no face. So he's kind of like thinking about ending it all when he gets this crazy call. Now, the more that they look into this weird ass, because they all kind of go into the building and they're looking around and then they send a search party up to look for the 60 odd people that have disappeared. And that search party of seven people also disappears. And then they start hearing voices that seem to be coming out of the walls and seem to be like yelling for them to help them. Like they don't know where they are and all this other kind of stuff. So at this point, um, you know, and the weird shit that's going on with them finding the hand and then matching the hand up with this body that crashed through a greenhouse somehow, like many miles away. So they're like, okay, well, this is some weird shit. And then he remembers uh, that a year or two before he had picked up like this petty criminal named Jimmy Devlin, who had been in the middle of like robbing a jewelry store or something like that. And he had told the police a story that the two, his two compatriots, his two accomplices had basically been sucked into a wall while he was watching and he got the fuck out of there. Now, obviously he got done for the crime. It's like nobody believed him uh, because it's a crazy ass story, but because Jack Carter remembered that weird ass story, the remember the weird ass story that he had told, he goes to a pub and gets and picks up Jimmy Devlin and, you know, brings him in on the, like as a consultant, like on the investigation, because he has apparently seen something like this before. Uh, and as that goes on, as that investigation goes on. Also, there's this government agency, like I said, that comes in led by a dude named Romer, who is very sketchy, not sketchy, but he's just like sinister, I guess is a better word. And he seems to know a lot more about what's going on than anyone else and doesn't really, isn't real free with that information. But basically what you come to is that these storms that happen are some kind of, I mean, like I said, it's not like hard science or anything like that, but it's some kind of electrical alchemical sort of reaction. And every now and then there'll be this big, huge storm. It's very localized. 
And what it will essentially do is it sort of takes away the boundary between living tissue and non-living tissue. So what ended up happening with all those people at the party is that because this storm, which this government agency has codenamed a dark fall, it's centered around this one office building in this one particular place and made it so that the people that were in the building became essentially absorbed into the building. Uh, so they're still in there, uh, but their bodies have been integrated with the non-living material of the building, you know, concrete, steel, whatever. And uh, so they're still alive somehow, but there's also a thing called a returner. They said, every, which is, you know, the guy that fell through the greenhouse, the woman that came out on the street and then started eating people. When the people return, by and large, uh, they're not really normal anymore. They do seem to have, they retain some of their human attributes and some of their memories and things, but because they've been integrated in various ways with the inorganic material that they were absorbed into, a lot of them come out sort of monstrous. Either they, you know, they'll be like, you know, have crazy, like the, the one common thing is, uh, you know, somebody will get sucked into the wall and if they get sucked back out, like they'll start, liquid concrete will like start coming out of their mouth and stuff like that, you know, but they're still, like I said, alive and they're still kind of strong. So basically you have, you know, people get picked off one by one, people get sucked into the walls. There's various rules about what, what will happen because the even though the storm's going all the time, it doesn't always... You know, it has to be like a certain, there has to be like a certain something going on in the dark fall storm for this uh, porousness to come in. So, so people start getting absorbed into the building essentially. So what you have other than, you know, the first little bit of the book, which like I said, it kind of goes into a little bit of character development, a little stuff that's, you know, happening outside, like with the woman that ends up in London and like with the guy that crashes through the greenhouse and then like introduce introducing us to Jack Cardiff and Jimmy Devlin and people like that. Other than that, uh, pretty much the entire story takes place inside this office block as all of these cops, detectives, and other people that are still in there are trying to figure out what's going on. And once they figure out what's going on, how they can, you know, stop it or how they can get the fuck out of the building without you know, getting killed by various uh, things that are going on inside the building and outside the building. So as I said, this is very much, it's almost kind of like, it reminds me a little bit of like Clive Barker meets Die Hard. <laughs> like maybe that's like maybe a weird thing to say, but it's just, this is a very like action packed, survival oriented kind of story where everyone, like I said, pretty much the whole thing takes place inside this one office building. And all of the tension and suspense and everything like that comes from, you know, people getting picked off, never knowing like when the dark fall energy is going to manifest and it's going to make people like suck into the walls. Like you can't be touching the walls or anything like that, or it will like suck you in. You can't even be touching any of the furniture. They have like, you know, they have safeguards uh, against it, but it's just kind of like, you know, it, it's really, really easy to happen, you know, and then you have like people coming back through the walls and not knowing what the fuck is going on and being all like monstrously, you know, changed and shit like that. And then there's like some shit with Romer too, who's like the, the guy that's like the head of the special investigations team who seems to know more about it than anybody else, but still doesn't really know. Because like I said, this is something that has happened before. I think they even mention at some point, like some famous like disappearances cases, like some shit that happened in the Bermuda Triangle, like Flight 19, uh, you know, the Mary Celeste and all those kind of things where something just kind of vanished into thin air. And they're making the argument that that was actually a dark fall storm. Like, so, so wherever this thing was in the world, um, it was just like sucked into it, like integrated into some other shit and it just like vanished. So that's kind of the whole premise of it, which like I said, is a really, really cool premise. Um, so if you just, if you're just in the mood for like a roller coaster survival type, like I said, it's not super deep. It's not super like the science isn't real. You know, it's just kind of like, it's believable enough 
type of thing where it's just kind of like, and you can just go along for the ride and go, oh yeah, I suppose so. And then it just kind of like ramps up and ramps up and ramps up. I mean, the characterization is really good. Um, you know, Jack Cardiff is a really uh, sympathetic character, you know, like the main cop. And uh, even Jimmy Devlin, who starts out as kind of like this real like hostile petty criminal, essentially. Um, he really like has a good character arc in there too. And then later on, another character is introduced to is a returner, but from a very different time. So that's because that's another thing that it, you can kind of get sucked in at one point and then thrown out like a long time later. So, you know, so there's there, there's that kind of uh, situation going on too. So when you have like these characters and battling against all of these people that have been sucked into the walls and have been spit back out and now are like monsters essentially, you know, it's just a great, you know, and, and meanwhile, this whole storm is raging outside, they can't leave. And it's just kind of like, you know, lightning keeps striking the building and like making floors crash in on themselves. And you know, the elevator doesn't work and all this other kind of stuff too. So it's just kind of like becomes sort of like a race to the finish type of thing where, you know, you get to the end and they're trying to like go up, go up to the roof and they're trying to like climb down the elevator shaft and like all this other kind of stuff. So it's like really, really good, tense, just like an action packed thriller type of thing, you know, but with monsters and stuff too. The only criticism um, is that maybe, maybe it's, it was just slightly, slightly too long because it did get a little bit repetitive toward the end, but that's like a very, very minor uh, criticism. I mean, on the whole, uh, you really were rooting for these characters. It's just like, yeah, man, get the fuck out of there. And it's just like, with sh as shit started getting shittier and shittier, worse and worse, you know, you really just felt for them to be like, oh man, what the fuck now what? You know what I mean? So it's just that kind of story. Um, like I said, it's not super deep. It's not, but it's a great, great concept. I just love the mystery aspect of it. I was just like all these, this whole building full of people vanishing and then with just that hand laying there, that's just a great, uh, that's a great starting point. Uh, you know, and then everybody get, like getting absorbed into the walls. That's just a fantastic, fantastic idea. So I really, really love the concept of this, the characterization, and it's just like a very, very fast paced, action packed, uh, you know, just thrill ride of a novel. So like I said, at the end, it does go a lot more into like, it's not gross, gross. Like, like I said, it's not, Maybe not like, um, I'm trying to think of like some really, really gross shit that I read like around this time period. Like, is it like Jack Ketchum or, um, it was like Douglas Clegg or something like that. I think I got, I've got one of his gross ass books that I'm going to review at some point. Cause I bought that around the same time as I bought this. So it's not quite as gross as that. It's almost more cl like a Clive Barkerian because these people are coming back out of the walls and have, like I said, like concrete sticking out of them and shit like that. So it's, it's that kind of shit, uh, which is really cool. I really, really like that concept a lot. So yeah, um, I don't know how easy it is to get hold of nowadays. I mean, I'm assuming you probably can get it. I just bought this at like probably Barnes and Noble or something like that, like in 2003, 2004, somewhere around there. Like I said, I'm pretty sure this original story came out in 1992, um, but this version came out in 2003. It's weird because I didn't realize that this story was that old from 1992. You really can't tell. I mean, other than, you know, people not having cell phones and, you know, it being much harder to trace people's ID, for example, uh, there was that kind of thing where it was like, you know, harder to figure out police information, whereas nowadays it'd be like instant, whereas back then you had to wait. Um, but other than that, you really can't tell, or as I really can't tell that this was written in 1992. It's a very, it seems like a very timeless type of story. Um, so, you know, if, if you can get hold of it and you really like that type of thing, like I said, if you like Bentley Little or, you know, even Richard Lehman, although I think, like I said, I, I like Stephen Laws quite a bit better than, uh, Richard Lehman, although I have some of his other books, uh, that I'm going to review as well. And like I said, Stephen Laws, this is actually not the first book of his I read. I'm pretty sure The Worm was the first one and, um, and Fear Me, uh, were also quite good. And I might have those somewhere, so I might end up, cause I'm pretty sure I bought those at some point. So unless I gave them away or something, they might still be in here. I don't know. I'll have a look. Cause I have like a, sh I, I have not only all these books here behind me, but you know, and I have a shit ton there, but I also have a shit ton up in the attic and I also have a shit ton in that there's a closet right there. And there's like a whole stacks of little paperbacks like that, like up there. And I kind of forget what I have. So, <laughs> so maybe I'll be doing some more Stephen Laws in the future, but yeah, uh, seriously, check it out. Uh, it's really, really good. It's just like a fun action packed, sci-fi horror type body horror type thing uh but yeah it's really good so you should read it that will do it for this tomes of terror and i will see you guys on the next one bye <laughs>